Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. Uh, let's continue with our discussion of uh, Girish Karnad's important play, Tughlaq, which is based on the historical life of the mid 14th century Delhi Sultan, Muhammad bin Tughlaq, uh, 19, uh, 1325 to 1341, and uh, reworks it to illuminate the life of Tughlaq, to illuminate the contradictions that constitute uh, political sovereignty. Right. So one, this is one of those uh, well-known examples of historical drama by Girish Karnad, which uh, like uh, his other plays on, let's say, for example, Tipu Sultan, which is called The Dreams of Tipu, both uh, use historical uh, figures um, and reworks them to give them a contemporary political significance. One of Karnad's earliest works, uh, Tughlaq, which he wrote when he was just uh, 26, um, this is 1964, um, bears, also bears, as Karnad said of the play, a contemporary political significance in the allusions its protagonist, the Sultan Tughlaq, makes to modern political figures of various ideological dispensations, whether it is Gandhi's uh, individualist spirituality uh, or Nehru's ecstatic visions of national vitality that we imagine to be a function of the love between the leader and the people and the fantasies of absolute power, which include Indra and Sanjay Gandhi, and more recently, uh, Muslim, Hindu, and Sikh fundamentalists. So uh, you can think of Tughlaq as a composite figure, someone who includes these uh, different strands of, uh, of political uh, and ideological uh, thought. Uh, so. Um, on one hand, you have, for example, uh, the irony between Tughlaq being uh, someone who wants to renounce violence, hmm, uh, someone who wants to be imagined as a secular humanist who brings about certain reformist measures uh, in his kingdom, uh, namely, uh, you know, lifting the uh, jizya tax, which was levied on uh, non-Muslim populations. Um, or as someone who believes that he uh, he would he, he that he is the object of uh, the people's devotion, uh, that he is an ideal uh, and just ruler. Or he's also seen sometimes in the play as someone who is uh, pursuing his own fantasies of absolute power, which uh, invariably end up in uh, defeat, in betrayal, in uh, bloodshed. Hmm? And so you see these different ideological disp dispensations working together, and there's no resolution to these different uh, ideological camps, ideological uh, uh, standpoints in the figure of Tughlaq. So over the course of the play, it becomes impossible to reconcile these different phases of or facets of Tughlaq self, which remains unstable and fragmented constructs that do not possess or reveal any kind of a stable essence. So uh, there's a constant, for example, uh, uh, reference to performance, to masks, to playing and acting in the play. Right? So uh, this constant um, use of these terms seems to suggest that Tughlaq's uh, performance right, as a sultan, as a king, as someone who would like to be perceived as someone who is just an, 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 an ideal ruler, in fact, foregrounds or exposes the instability and the sense of fragmentation that Tughlaq experiences across the play through the, the various encounters that he has with the different characters, especially our characters, people in who uh, he had most trusted in his life, end up uh, betraying him for various reasons. The play itself comprises of the, the Sultan himself, 
Uh, then there is Azam and his childhood friend Aziz, who is a lowly Muslim washerman. Uh, the Sultan's stepmother, uh, incestuous stepmother, uh, his Prime Minister Najib, uh, his court chronicler and historian uh, Barani, uh, the Sheikh Imamuddin, you have one of the court nobles, uh, Shiabuddin, another noble Ratan Singh, then you have the Sheikh Shamsuddin, and the Abbasid Caliph of uh, Baghdad, Ghiasuddin Abbasid. Over the course of the play, the Sultan is repeatedly betrayed by the people he most trusts, uh, which compels him to question and uphold his own principles and ideals of justice. So you see the growing, increasing uh, isolation of Tukluk, uh, his sense of loneliness, uh, his sense of self-doubt that plagues him uh, throughout the play as more and more people betray him, deceive him for power. What emerges from the reading of the play is a monarch who believes he is a transcendental subject above and without the laws of justice that he formulates. So uh, the problem lies in the fact that he always perceives himself as someone who is above and beyond the very laws of justice that he formulates uh, to rule his kingdom. Right? So it's never a, a sense of justice which is being constructed by specific situations, by uh, the relationship that he shares with the people. But it is something that is unanimously, uh, you know, uh, unilaterally imposed by Tukluk on his people simply because he's driven by a particular ideal of justice. Right? And that ideal, of course, itself remains fairly vague. You know, you know it's, it's an ideal and you're not entirely sure what the ideal kingdom would look like for the Sultan. Uh, he's always contradicting himself. He's always pulled apart by the various uh, contradictory ideological positions that he occupies throughout the play. There's only an absolute notion of the good that for Tughlaq is above the historical considerations of his different subjects and citizens. By the end, the Sultan is confronted by the ironies of his political decisions that only result in death and bloodshed. The Sultan initially presents himself as a secular humanist who is willing to acknowledge his own mistake of levying jizya tax on a Brahmin and illegally appropriating his land. Um, so even his desire to shift the capital from Delhi to Deogir or Dalatabad, uh, which is a Hindu majoritarian city, is Tughlaq's wish to win the favor of the Hindus in his state in his kingdom. And he also wants to be known as a symbol of Hindu-Muslim unity. And, uh, but ironically, the, the, the journey from uh, Delhi to Dalatabad, which uh, is more centrally located, because Tughlaq is uh, concerned and anxious that Delhi is on the fringes of the, of the kingdom and can always be beset, uh, attacked by war, by neighboring chieftains and kings. And he also wishes to actually secure the southern extremities of his kingdom, which is why he decides to move the capital to Dalatabad, which is more centrally located. And so he does the move for strategic reasons, but also for uh, reasons of uh, religious harmony and unity, right? Because he wants to be perceived by the Hindu majoritarian uh, population as a symbol of, uh, of uh, as a secular symbol of unity and uh, love. But the, the journey from Delhi to Dalatabad actually ends in uh, starvation, in illness uh, and disease and death. Right? Because although there's a, there's a very powerful scene, uh, in fact, the play itself is divided into 13 scenes, and uh, in one of the scenes in, towards the middle of the play, uh, you have a vision of uh, starvation and death as the people uh, make a long line to, on their way to uh, Dalatabad, but end up losing their health, their lives, and their property, their assets to wayside robbers. So the collapse of his empire results in famine, rebellions, and economic chaos. <laughs>
मोहम्मद मोहम्मद अम्मी जान खूब मौके पर आ गई अम्मी जान अगर दो लम्हे पहले आ जाती तो दुनिया के इलमी खजाने का बहुत नुकसान हो जाता ऐसा क्या हुआ क्या हो गया दो लम्हे मैं अभी अभी इल में शतरंज के एक अहम मसले का हल तलाश कर रहा था जिसमें अल अदली शराबी जैसे पहुंचे हुए आलम भी नाकाम साबित हुए थे लेकिन वो हल मुझे मिल गया है अम्मी और किस कदर आसान है पर मैं क्या समझू मोहम्मद <laughs> समझना चाहे तो समझ भी जाए मगर समझने की चाह भी तो हो बेकार की बात मत करो मैं यहाँ शतरंज खेलने नहीं आई अगर इतनी गरज है तो बुलवा लो अपने शतरंजी दोस्त मुल्क को उसे बताओ अपना हल बजा फरमाया अम्मी जान शतरंज की चाल चलनी हो तो सिर्फ आइन मुल्क के साथ ही लेकिन अब ऐसी ही सूरत पेश हुई है अम्मी मगर मोहरे काट के नहीं रहे जिंदा फौजी मोहरे बन गए कभी कभी तो तुम पहले बुझाने लगते हो मोहम्मद आमी मेरा हमदम शतरंज का दोस्त आइन मुल्क मैं फौज दिल्ली की तरफ रवाना हो चुका है पर पर क्यों मोहम्मद पता नहीं अम्मी तीन रोज हुए मगज पच्ची कर रहा हूं लेकिन अभी तक समझ नहीं पाया कि आखिर मेरे जिगरी दोस्त ने बिना वजह क्यों मेरे खिलाफ तलवार उठाई है किसी बात पर अनबन तो नहीं हुई अनबन कहां से हो अम्मी जान आपको तो मालूम है मेरी तख्त नशीनी के दौरान अनवत की हालत किस कदर खराब थी चारों तरफ लूट मार कतलो गारत जारी थी मैं सूरत हालात से परेशान हो चुका था तो मैंने आइन मुल्क को वहां भेजा और उसने जाते ही फसादियों का सफाया कर दिया फिर जब दक्षिण में भी बगावत की आग भड़क उठी तो मैंने उससे दरख्वास्त की कि वो मेरी तरफ से दक्षिण जाए और वहां भी अवध की सी खुशहाली लाए उसकी कुमुक के लिए मैंने अपनी आधी फौज भी भिजवा दी थी तीन महीने हो गए लेकिन उसका कोई माकूल जवाब नहीं आया तीन रोज हुए मेरे मुखबिर का लिखा एक खत मिला जिसमें उल मुल्क की दगाबाजी की दास्तान दर्ज थी लिखा था आठ रोज हुए उसे दिल्ली की तरफ कूच किए हुए तो अब तुम क्या करोगे मोहम्मद करना क्या है अम्मी बची खुची फौज लेकर उससे जूझना है बची खुची फौज हाँ अम्मी मेरे पास अब उसकी फौज का आठवा हिस्सा भी नहीं है मोहम्मद देखो ना शतरंज के इस मसले का हल पाकर मैं किस कदर खुश था लेकिन तुमने आइन उल मुल्क का जिक्र छेड़कर वो खुशी खाक में मिला दी मैं आपकी तशरीफ आवरी का सबब जानना तो भूल ही गया अब इसकी कोई जरूरत नहीं रही मोहम्मद क्यों कुछ खास बात नहीं थी दरअसल मैं ये जानना चाहती थी कि आजकल तुम किन चीजों में फंसे हो दिन चढ़े तुम्हारे कमरे में रोशनी रहती है रात भर जागते रहते हो आखिर अपनी से दुश्मनी क्यों मोहम्मद यानी आप समझती हैं मैं उन मुल्क की फिक्र में घुला जा रहा हूं अम्मी जान फिक्रमंदी या मोहब्बत की हालत में नींद ना आने की बातें शायरों की ख्याली उड़ानी है अगर मैं इस कदर फिक्रमंद होता तो शतरंज के मसले में कैसे उलझा रहता तो फिर आज पर क्या करते हो अल्लाह से दरख्वास्त करता हूं कि आ खुदा मुझे नींद ना आए दिन तो यूं ही दुनियावी शोरों गुल में बीत जाता है मगर जो ही दिन का उजाला रुखसत होता है मैं रात की तारीखी को चीर कर आसमान के पार पहुंच जाता हूं फिर आसमान के तारों के इर्द गिर्द मंडराया करता हूं फिर इबन अल मोहतज और दुरुमान जैसे पापकार शायरों का कलाम गुनगुनाया करता हूं अभी एक एक दिल में एक ख्वाहिश जागती है कि अभी और इल्म हासिल करूं और तरक्की करूं और ऊपर उठू और और थिएटर स्कॉलर धारवाड़कर ड्रॉज आवर अटेंशन टू अनदर लेवल ऑफ आयरनी व्हिच इज तुगलक कंपीटिंग फॉर पावर विथ हिज इंसेस्ट स्टेप मदर द हिस्टोरियन बरानी एंड अ पावरफुल बट क्रेडुलस राइवल शेख इमामुद्दीन हु रिजेंबल्स हिम बट Tuglak's real double. In fact, uh, the the play makes use of a of a double doppelganger motif. The first double is, is the is the Sheikh Imam Uddin, who resembles uh, the Sultan, but the real double here is Aziz, who is the Muslim washerman, who.
who subverts each and every move of Tughlaqs by impersonating the Brahmin who loses his land and money to, money to the Sultan. Who he's also the wayside robber who steals from the sick and dying travelers as they journey from Delhi to Daratabad. He also produces counterfeit currency after the imperial decree to produce copper currency. And he also impersonates and kills the Abbasid Caliph Ghiasuddin, who has been invited by the Sultan to bless and purify his new capital, Daratabad. So let us first look at the early uh, passages of uh, the play, which would demonstrate uh, the uh, Sultan's um, uh, desire to be uh, a symbol of Hindu-Muslim unity. Right? So he wants to be perceived as a reformist uh, ruler, a secular humanist, in the early portion of the uh, first scene. So in the first scene, on page 7 and 8, Muhammad bin Tughlaq announces, My beloved people, you have heard the judgment of the Qazi and seen for yourselves how justice works in my kingdom. Without any consideration of might or weakness, religion or creed. May this moment burn bright and light up our path towards greater justice, equality, progress and peace. Not just peace, but a more purposeful life. Now, this is the Tughlaq's response to the Qazi's announcement that uh, the Brahmin, who has been uh, the, the Brahmin uh, Vishnu Prasad, who had lost his land to the Sultan, has been given back his land, uh, and the uh, jizya tax that it, that have been levied on Vishnu Prasad has al has also been lifted. Right? So earlier on, the Qazi's announcer says, "Attention, attention! In the name of the Allah." It is hereby announced that Vishnu Prasad, a Brahmin of Shiknar, had filed a suit against His Merciful Majesty that his land had been seized illegally by the officers of the state and that he should be given just compensation for the loss of the land and the privation resulting therefrom. The Qazi Imam Malik, having considered this matter carefully, has declared that the Brahmin's claim is just. That the Brahmin's claim is just and that his merciful majesty is guilty of illegal appropriation of land. The Qazi Imam Malik has further declared that in return for the land and in compensation of the privation resulting from its loss, the said Vishnu Prasad should receive a grant of 500 silver dinars from the state treasury. His merciful majesty has accepted the decision of the Qazi Imam Malik as just and in addition to the grant of 500 silver dinars has offered the said Vishnu Prasad, a post in the civil service to ensure him a regular and adequate income. So Vishnu Prasad is not, not only uh, exempted from paying the land uh, jizya tax, he is given back his land and he is also given uh, the position uh, in uh, the civil service right, with a regular income. So in response to that, Muhammad is very proud uh, of himself, uh, much to the resentment of his Muslim subjects that he has that peace and harmony equality and justice have reigned in his kingdom because of his rule and to achieve this end Dugla goes on to say i am taking a new step in which i hope i shall have your support and cooperation later this year the capital of my empire will be moved from delhi to daratabad and the crowd of course is shocked and and just you know bewildered your surprise is natural but i beg you to realize that this is no mad whim of a tyrant my ministers and I took this decision after careful thought and discussion. My empire is large now and embraces the south, and I need a capital which is at its heart. Delhi is too near the border, and as you will know, its peace is never free from the fear of invaders. But for me, the most important factor is that Dalatabad is a city of the Hindus, and as the capital, it will symbolize the bond between Muslims and Hindus, which I wish to develop and strengthen in my kingdom. I invite you all to accompany me to Daladabad. This is only an invitation and not an order. So initially it is an invitation and later it becomes an order. Only those who have faith in me may come with me. With their help, I shall build an empire which will be the envy of the world. Right? So it's almost as though his move from uh, Delhi to Daladabad is a way of testing the loyalty of his people. Only those who will believe in him will actually follow him, will make the arduous journey from Delhi to Deogir. Then 
there are also rumors amongst the people who are listening to the sultan uh, announcing his move to uh, to shift the capital from delhi to dalatabad and uh, we get to we learn that uh, that so the sultan had actually murdered his uh, father and brother when they were at prayer right so there there are these rumors spreading and of course sultan does not immediately confirm the veracity of the rumors uh, but initially we get to know that the uh, sultan had actually killed his father and brother during prayer all for an ideal and so the people uh, who are listening to him speak presumably muslims are very disappointed with the sultan for having desecrated ils islam for having corrupted to the very uh, act of praying by uh, the purity of praying by murdering his father and brother when they were at prayer and the people in the crowd also describe uh, the eloquence how entrancing the sheikh imam abdin is when he gave a sermon long speech to the audience about the sultan's uh, un-islamic act and his desecration of islam by murdering his father and brother during prayer so the people are completely taken over by the sheikh's uh, erudition the sheikh's eloquence and his uh, absolutely gravitating uh, personality and they also insinuate the resemblance of the sultan with the sheikh right so the 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 kind of symbolic resemblance identification of the sultan with the sheikh uh, is established early on in the play right so it's almost suggesting that there is another side to the sultan which is uh, which embodies the intolerance of religious thought right uh, a certain intolerant side perhaps to islam which comes through in the play and then there's a lot of argument also uh, because when one of the hindu men in the in the in the crowd says that perhaps the sultan has derived his habit of making speeches from the sheikh the other people in the crowd uh, the muslims are very upset and saying that he is an infidel to actually mock a saint like the sheikh you also have the you also have aziz and, Ad- and azam childhood friends in the audience uh, one of whom uh, is aziz who wishes to actually uh, who plans to impersonate the brahmin vishnu prasad uh, in order to actually subvert the uh, sultan's uh, decision to lift the jizya tax from uh, non muslims and uh, give him a position also in his own court so uh, so aziz decides to actually impersonate a brahmin he shaves his head and he goes to vishnu prasad uh, whose land has been confiscated by the uh, sultan and he also buys vishnu prasad's land uh, with a post uh, dated contract right so he he backdates the contract and he buys vishnu prasad's land from him and uh, he also earns a good 500 silver dinars from the uh, transaction because he buys vishnu prasad's land he impersonates him and he also gets back the money that belonged to vishnu prasad from the sultan's civil service right so he he gets he gets money and he also gets vishnu prasad's job in the civil service and then azam is worried and shocked he says why did you have to dress up in these ungodly clothes couldn't you have come like a proper muslim and aziz scandalizes but then what would happen to the king's impartial justice a muslim plaintiff against a muslim king right so he's obviously exploiting manipulating the sultan's self image as a secular uh, humanist uh, he doesn't want to present himself as a muslim plaintiff against a muslim king and he says that's exactly why he dressed up as a brahmin right and he impersonates vishnu prasad so that he can seemingly uphold the secular credentials of the sultan i mean where's the question of justice there aziz asks where's the equality between hindus and muslims if on the other hand the plaintiffs are hindu well you saw the crowds azam says it's complicated aziz replies it's a bit too subtle for you anyway here's my offer from tomorrow i join the civil service why don't you come along too i'll get you a job under me you know a brahmin with a muslim friend the sultan would like that so he is constantly exploiting the sultan's self impressions his his idealization of uh, hindu muslim unity and hindu muslim bonds so aziz and azam have a lot to gain from 
the Sultan's seemingly secular credentials and his move to Dalatabad because they actually make a lot of money, a lot of uh, unfair uh, wages and money from the move. Right. If you look at the character of the stepmother, she's someone who, is, who seems to bear a, an incestuous love for uh, Muhammad, but she's also someone who wants to control him. Right. She resents uh, the authority and control that uh, the historian Barani has over, uh, over uh, the Sultan, or for that matter, uh, the control, the faith that the Sultan has in Najib, who is his prime minister, uh, which is what then compels her to poison Najib and kill him, much to the Sultan's uh, shock. Meanwhile, uh, the move from Delhi to Dalatabad also wins resentment of some of the nobles in his court, one of whom is An Ul Mulk, who is the governor of uh, Agra. Right? And uh, he, has, he shares a rapport with the people of Agra. He has won uh, uh, their, their, their faith and loyalty in, in, uh, in his rule. And, uh, and he is very upset. He is betrayed when the, when the Sultan uh, transfers him to uh, the, gov the, the governorship of the Deccan. And so he does not want to actually uh, move from Agra to, to the Deccan. And so he decides to wage a war against the Sultan. And uh, the, the Sultan uh, the, uh, is very clever. Right? So he, he uh, decides, he plans to get uh, the Sheikh uh, Imamuddin uh, killed in, uh, in battle. Right? And he gets him killed even before the battle begins. What he does is he has an encounter with the Sheikh and uh, he ensures that he forbids uh, his people from coming to listen to the, uh, the argument, the debate that he has with the Sheikh. Now, Tughlaq exploits the fact that the, so the, the Sheikh looks like him. Right? And it is also Najib's idea that perhaps they should uh, trap the Sheikh in this battle because the sheikh is a formidable opponent uh, and he's the sternest critic of uh, the sultan's uh, uh, political plans. And so he decides to get the sheikh killed in battle against Anul Mulk. And uh, Najib himself is a man who is a Hindu convert uh, to Islam. Uh, he becomes, he converts to Islam thinking that Islam would bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. In his own words, he hoped that Islam would bring the kingdom of heaven on earth, but then ultimately it's not about uh, religion or religious conversion in as much as it, as it is about uh, political power that has to be wrested from enemies through war and violence. So they can only take action in the present moment, as he says, and so he encourages the, Sult uh, the Sultan to actually, uh, you know, uh, ensure that there's no trouble from Enul Mulk, that he quashes any uh, rebellion from Enul Mulk, uh, because uh, the Tughlaq's kingdom progressively becomes more and more insecure and hard to control over the course of the play, as different uh, chieftains, different nobles from his kingdom uh, rebel against him for his uh, decision to move the capital and for his uh, apparent uh, partiality towards Hindus. But uh, Muhammad is also very clever. He always tries to sow discord between, let's say, fathers and sons. So for one, so he invites uh, Shihabuddin, the prince of uh, Sampan Shahar, to be uh, in to be at his kingdom in his absence while he fights the war against Mulk, and uh, he he does this precisely because the Amir, who is the Shihabuddin's father, does not like him very much. So he tries to sow discord between father and son by seeking the son's favor and by giving him importance and position in his kingdom. And uh, the historian Barani is not uh, for the battle, right? He, he is very concerned that there will be unnecessarily, unnecessary bloodshed uh, in the name of Islam. So he does not wish to, for the king to fight uh, Ainul Mulk. And, uh, but Najim is against him and he, he encourages him. And the stepmother herself is actually quite concerned and worried about the Sultan and his move to fight this war and uh, to also get the sheikh killed. In the, in the third scene, right, the Sultan arranges for a meeting uh, in front of the great mosque with uh, the sheikh Imamuddin. 
who is a, a complete uh, critique of uh, Sultan's political plans and, and uh, ideological dispositions. There is a, a long uh, debate argument between the two, by the end of which um, uh, Imam Uddin has been convinced to actually uh, be present at the war, uh, at the battle with uh, Ainul Mulk. He, he, um, uh, the, the, the Sultan convinces him to uh, join uh, the battle as a, an emissary, as a messenger of peace, uh, to tell uh, Ainul Mulk that um, they will, uh, ha they, that, that they cannot fight a war where Muslims kill Muslims. It would be an, it would be an unfortunate loss of life uh, in the name of Islam. And so he tries to convince uh, the Imam to, uh, to go as a emissary, as a messenger of peace, to um, completely uh, in, the, in the name of Islam. Right? So, and he also makes sure that there is no one, uh, there's no witness to the meeting, which is why he forbids uh, his people from coming. In the initial uh, discussion or debate between the two, uh, Imam, the Imam says that the Sultan has transgressed and he has desecrated the Quran by uh, by creating uh, this, by lifting the jizya tax, by shifting the capital, and by projecting himself as uh, as a as a support of Hindus. Uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq here again projects himself as someone who is secular. And he says that I can never make Islam or religion the basis of rule, that politics and religion have to be kept separate. But for the Imam, he says that one can never transgress the, uh, the rules, the injunctions laid down by the Quran, that all rule, political rule is uh, fundamentally uh, based on the Quran. So the Tughlaq says that, uh, the Imam first says, please, your majesty, even you can't believe that. You can't believe what? That Muhammad has gone against the tenets of Islam. And Imam Muhammad says, I have never gone against the tenets of Islam. I've always followed. I've been, always been devoted to Islam. And the Imam says, I can quote scores of transgressions. If they weren't willful, they could only be results of ignorance. But I can't believe that in a scholar of your eminence, perhaps you're sincere. But if one fails to understand what the Quran says, one must ask the Sayyids and the Ulama. Instead, you have put the best of them behind bars in the name of justice. Muhammad, they tried to indulge in politics. This is the religious leaders of the ulama and the Sayyids. I couldn't allow that. I have never denied the word of God, Sheikh Sahib, because it's my bread and drink. I need it most when the surrounding void pushes itself into my soul and starts putting out every light burning there. But I'm alone in my life. My kingdom has millions, Muslims, Hindus, Jains, Yes, there is dirt and sickness in my kingdom. But why should I call on God to clean up the dirt deposited by men? So he says that he's alone. There's a deep sense of isolation, right? Because he doesn't know how he can rule a kingdom while supporting any particular religious sect, right? So religious group. So he has to be above all forms of partisanship in order to be a just ruler. But in the process, he also has to isolate himself because he cannot trust anyone. Right? He's unable, he's incapable of trusting anyone. Uh, even the, the religious leaders of the ulema have indulged in politics, he says, that they have tried to fragment uh, the kingdom along religious lines, which uh, the Sultan fears will completely uh, result in the uh, destruction uh, of his kingdom. So why should I call God? So he seems that he seems to be the kind of person who does not want to divest himself of agency by investing the same agency in God, but that only men, only a ruler like him, can clean up the dirt deposited by other men. The Imam says, because only the voice of God, the Holy Word, can do it. Please listen to me, Your Majesty. The Arabs spread Islam around the world, and they struggled and fought for it for 700 years. They are tired now, limp and exhausted. But their work must continue and we must and we need someone to take the lead. You could do it. You are one of the most powerful kings on earth today and you could spread the kingdom of heaven on earth. God has given you everything, power, learning, intelligence, talent. Now you must repay his debt. Right? So this is in stark contrast to Najib or to the Sultan himself who believes that one cannot wait for God to act on your behalf. One has to act. One has to act on one's own terms. Then the Imam says, uh, that are you willing to actually do it without the Quran to guide you? 
Beware, Sultan, you are trying to become another god. It's a sin worse than patricide. Right? So what is worse than patricide is to, is to claim to be god yourself. Right? So, of course, the Imam is also insinuating uh, the Tughlaq's, Tughlaq's uh, murder of his father and brother during prayer. And Muhammad is also himself proud of being the grandson of a slave who, who wrested power from the Delhi Sultanate. Right? So he, a lot of his own, his own lineage, his own ancestry has to do with uh, people who were once slaves, who were once disenfranchised, but have now acquired power. They have wrested power from the ruling powers. Imam says, religion, politics, Take heed, Sultan, one day these verbal distinctions will rip you into two. Right? There's no distinction for the Imam, but for Tughlaq there seems to be at least a distinction between religious rule and political rule, which have to be kept separate. The Muhammad says, don't I know it? I still remember the days when I read the Greeks, Sukrat, who took poison so he could give the world the drink of gods, Aflatun, who condemned poets and wrote incomparable beautiful poetry himself, and I can still feel the tr thrill with which I found a new world, a world I had not found in the Arabs or even the Quran. They tore me into shreds, and to be whole now, I shall have to kill the part of me which sang to them. And my kingdom too is what I am, torn into pieces by visions whose validity I can't deny. You are asking me to make myself complete by killing the Greek in me, and you propose to unify my people by denying the visions which led Zarastra or the Buddha. I'm sorry, but it can't be done. Right? So he presents himself as someone who is torn apart from these different visions of justice, these different visions of ethical justice from the Buddha or Sarastra or uh, the Greek, the Greek, uh, early Greek philosophers and poets. So the Sultan is obviously being portrayed in the play as someone who is learned, someone who is intelligent, but is, but is politically inept. He, he, he seems to lack the, uh, the wisdom uh, to be able to actually balance, carefully balance, or negotiate uh, the contradictions that make up his own persona, right? The contradictions, the, the political contradictions between the subjects uh, who are divided along lines of class and religion and his own uh, position as a Muslim sultan, a Muslim sultan in a Hindu majoritarian state. He even insinuates that he has forbidden the people from attending the meeting because the people do not have only only have faith in him and not in the sheikh who is dividing the population along communal lines. But initially, later, later on, he tries to trick the sheikh into uh, meeting Ainul Mulk as a peace emissary. Muhammad tells the sheikh that the people will assume that he will, he is a spy, right? and that he is his spy, that they will probably suspect that he is a spy of uh, of Islam, and as someone who has tried to rise against the sultan. So he threatens him. But he also tells him that the people are with him, that the people only believe in him, and that the only way that the Imam can actually secure his own power and life is by presenting himself as an emissary of peace at the uh, battlefront. So he does, but then of course what happens at the battle is an ironic tragedy where the uh, Imam is killed um, even before the battle can begin, where just as the Sultan has declared the battle open and on. Uh, he is shot by an arrow and he's killed because they assume the opposition assumes that he is the Sultan. And one of the people who actually helps the Sultan in this entire plan and conspiracy is Ratan Singh. Ratan Singh, who is uh, a Hindu but uh, is also loyal to the Sultan. The Sultan also lets go of Ainul Mulk and he restores his position as the governor of Agra and uh, he also ensures that the sheikh is killed in battle. He observes a day of mourning for the sheikh. There will be no, he says, there will be no festivities to celebrate the victory. When men like him die, it's a sin to be alive. Right? So he makes it seem like as though the sultan, uh, the sheikh is, was a, a pious and honest and in, an integral uh, subject to his kingdom. And it is Ratan Singh who reveals what actually happens on the battlefront. He says, so we marched towards Ainul Mulk's army. This is what he tells Shihabuddin, the prince of Shampanshair. We marched towards, we, we marched towards Ainul Mulk's army led by the gorgeous sheikh on the royal elephant. The elephant halted about a hundred yards away from the enemy. This is in scene four. 
the sheikh stood up on it and tried to say something when a trumpeter on our side sounded the charge. The battle was on. Yes, my dear Shihab, Ain ul Mulk didn't start the battle. We did. And the Sultan? R Ratan Singh replies, I couldn't understand what was happening. Neither did the sheikh, obviously. His face was twisted with fear, but he was shouting at the top of his voice, asking us to stop. He didn't stand a chance. Arrows poured into him, and within minutes, he looked a gory human porcupine. And the Sultan, didn't he do anything? Shehabuddin asks. Ratan Singh replies, he did. The sheikh plunged down from the elephant, and over his corpse, we fled in confusion. The enemy was convinced the Sultan was dead, and they pursued us. They walked right into the trap. It was the bloodiest mass massacre I've ever seen. We won. Sheikh Imamuddin was murdered, you know, in cold blood. So Sheikh Imamuddin has just been used as a decoy, as a scapegoat to win the war against Enul Mulk. Later in the scene five, you see again a new conspiracy to kill the Sultan, uh, a conspiracy between Shihabuddin and uh, the two Amirs, the two nobles of the of the royal court. And they're obviously very upset that the Sultan has decided to move the kingdom and the capital from Delhi to Taladabad, Tal which is a Hindu city where the Muslims do not have as much power. So again, they decide to uh, murder the Sultan when he is at prayer in the mosque. Sheikh Shamsuddin uh, tries to convince Shihabuddin to actually murder the Sultan. Right? Although Shihabuddin is initially unwilling because he wants to distinguish himself from the other sheikhs who have indulged in uh, political conspiracies against the Sultan. Many of these sheikhs, Sheikh Haidari, Sheikh Hud, and so on, have been sent off in exile, have been exiled by the Sultan. Many of them are in prison, so which is why Shihabuddin is not, is not, is reluctant to actually uh, rise up in rebellion against the uh, Sultan and kill him. But the Sheikh Shamsuddin is trying to convince him to be a part of the conspiracy to uh, hatch a plot, a plan, a plan to murder the Sultan. They also discover that the, that the Sultan's soldiers had gone from door to door, forbidding people from attending the meeting between uh, the Sheikh and the Sultan. They're also very res uh, resentful and, and upset that, uh, that uh, the Sultan has lifted the jizya tax uh, when the Quran sanctions four taxes on non-believers and non-Muslims. Right. So they are upset that the jizya sanctioned by the Quran is not being levied anymore, being paid anymore by infidels. So these people definitely want to divide the kingdom along communal lines. In fact, it's Shehabuddin's father who is an ally of the Sheikh and the two Amirs. But they are also trying to recruit uh, Shehabuddin into the plan. Right? Ratan Singh uh, seems to be part of the plan, but he, in, in, he, uh, he uh, ends up betraying them in the end when he writes a letter to the Sultan warning him of this conspiracy, this plan to assassinate him. Ratan Singh says, don't be stupid Shihab, don't tell me you still think the Amirs want to fight the Sultan in the open, right? because the Amirs don't have the power to fight the Sultan in the open, so they can only fight him in the sly. You see what it is, Shihab is an intelligent young man, but he's just too nice. You see his father, Shihabuddin, don't Ratan, Ratan Singh, come on. Everyone knows about it. His father is supposed to have killed my father by treachery and usurped the kingdom. Shihab can't forget that. He wants to make up for it. That's why I'm here as his adopted brother. And that's why he just can't stand the mention of treachery to Shihabuddin. So this is what he's saying to himself. To Shihabuddin, don't overdo it. You'll have to face it someday after all. What the Sultan do to Sheikh Imamuddin? Okay, so he, he, he tries to threaten him. He tells him that of the possibility that the Sultan may also end up uh, murdering him and the other sheikhs uh, if uh, they, do not, they do not take action to stop the Sultan. So they plan to act in the name of Islam and Ratan Singh seems to go, go along with their plan but then later on he ends up becoming the most loyal uh, subject of the Sultan by warning him of the plan of the plot to assassinate him. So even though uh, prayer is supposed to be a pure moment where there cannot be any violence and bloodshed. They, uh, the Amirs and the Sheikh, corrupt as they are, uh, anxious to secure the power, the, their own authority and the power of the Muslims, uh, decides to actually attack the Sultan precisely during prayer. 
So this happens in scene six, where the Amiris and the Sh- and, uh, and Shihabuddin are uh, on the verge of carrying out executing their plan. But Tughlaq uh, pretends to not know what's happening. Initially, they try to beg. Shihabuddin tries to implore the Sultan, as- asking him not to change the capital from Delhi to Taratabad. But then Muhammad is not willing to listen to them. He also announces the circulation of copper currency uh, along with silver dinars. And when the public protest, he says that you'll have to just imagine that the copper currency has the same value as silver and gold. And that if they have faith in him, they will also have faith in the copper currency. Right? And this is, uh, this is also very prescient, a very prescient move because this anticipates the uh, the uh, circulation of uh, the introduction of paper currency in China 50 years later. So it's all about faith. He says, if you have faith in me, if you have faith in the Sultan. So kingship, right, being Sultan itself becomes a fetish right, because one has to have faith in it, even though the power of the Sultan is actually increasingly growing hollow. It's not absolute power. It's not a transcendental power, but it's actually growing more and more insecure and hollow. And yet, People have to pretend as though uh, ultimate power and authority is vested in the Sultan, just like it is in the currency he introduces in the kingdom as a common mode of exchange. Tughlaq seems to actually um, initially beg their support, the support of the Amirs and, the Sh- and Shihabuddin. But Shihabuddin is embarrassed and says it's not, it's not right for a king to beg. A king should only command. But then obviously by now we know that uh, that uh, the Sultan knows of their plan. So he gets up, he walks to the throne and he picks up a copy of the Quran and he asks them to swear on the Quran that they will support him in all measure. And Shihabuddin is unwilling and he says, does his majesty distrust me so much that he needs an oath on the Quran from us? And that is when uh, the Sultan rises up in rage against Shihabuddin and the others and from nowhere 20 Hindu soldiers rush in with spears and they surround the armies. And as the armies try to run out, the soldiers bar their way and then the soldiers drag them away, all except Shihabuddin. And while all this is going on, uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq is just praying unconcerned. It's only after he finishes his prayer that he steps down from the throne and there's a silence and Shihabuddin asks him, how he knew, how he got to know about the conspiracy. And then he says that, he mentions the letter that he got from Ratan Singh, uh, warning him about the uh, plot to assassinate him. And he asks Shihabuddin that, why have you gone against me? What have I done wrong? And Shihabuddin says, get on with your killing, Muhammad, or does your hand refuse to rise against me? Beware, you won't be able to trap me with your wiles. I'm not an mulk to live crushed under your kindness. Right? And Muhammad Slowly, slowly takes out his dagger and repeatedly stabs uh, Shehabuddin until he is dead. And this leaves Muhammad feeling rather anguished. Uh, the Sultan asks, why must this happen to his historian? Why must this happen, Barani? Are all those I trust condemned to go down in history as traitors? What is happening? Tell me, Barani, will my, will my reign be nothing more than a tortured scream which will stab the night and melt away in silence? Najib, see that every man involved in this is caught and beheaded. So in order to actually completely quash the rebellion and to make sure that there are no witnesses to the, to the, to the murder, he asks his prime minister to, to uh, capture each and every man who was, caught with, who was involved in the conspiracy. He wants to stuff their bodies with straw and hang them up in the palace yard for everyone to watch as an example to all those who wish to transgress and challenge his rule. He also decides to hold a funeral for uh, uh, Shihabuddin uh, and uh, he uh, wishes to um, remember Shihabuddin uh, as a martyr, as someone who died uh, protecting the Sultan from the attack. Right? So he also invites uh, Shihabuddin's father to the funeral and treats him with the respect that's due to the father of a loyal nobleman. So you see how clever uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq is that even though he is, he's been attacked, he's been betrayed by uh, a person whom he trusted. Uh, he wants to be uh, believe. He wants the people to believe that, uh, all, all those concerned to be to believe that he is um, a martyr who who tried to who 
who, who died uh, trying to protect the Sultan's life from uh, the, uh, the attacking noblemen. And that's when Muhammad bin Tughlaq decides to make, uh, make it compulsory for everyone to leave Delhi, to vacate Delhi and to leave for Dalatabad because uh, he, uh, he feels that he has to make the trip as soon as possible before he is again betrayed and his moves are uh, he is frustrated by all his enemies. He also, he also decides that there will be no more praying in the kingdom because now praying has also been com has come to be associated with murder and betrayal and so he says there will be no more praying in the kingdom. He tells his Prime Minister, anyone caught praying will be severely punished. Henceforth, let the moment of prayer walk my streets in silence and leave without a trace. Right? So prayer is, comes to be associated with, identified with betrayal and uh, bloodshed. In scene 7, uh, you see Azi, Aziz and Azam, um, uh, you know, and acting, acting as wayside robbers who uh, kill and uh, steal uh, the assets, the property, the money of the wealth of the people uh, who are moving from uh, Delhi to Dalatabad, right? And the journey itself is an arduous one, which results, which which ends in in uh, in sickness and 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 disease and death. In fact, he also uh, Aziz also uh, impersonates the Brahmin uh, in the camp, and he even uh, this allows a Hindu woman who needs. Uh, to take her child to a nearby hospital or doctor, refuses to let her go. Right? Even after her child is dead, she refuses to let the Hindu woman go. And this is when Aziz also decides to, uh, plans to produce counterfeit copper currency. Right? So he tells, uh, he tells Azam, don't call me Aziz, I've told you. As for her, referring to the Hindu woman, I've only obeyed my orders. Besides, I'm a Brahmin and she won't complain against a Brahmin to a Muslim officer. That will send her straight to hell. In any case, and listen to this carefully, we won't stay in the Sultan's service for long. I heard some rumors in Delhi. The Sultan is going to introduce copper coins soon, and a copper coin will have the same value as a silver dinar. What do you say to that? In scene 8, uh, the Sultan meets one of the uh, young soldiers who doesn't recognize him initially. Uh, who has been uh, entrusted with the responsibility of guarding the, um, the fort right, uh, in uh, Dalatabad. And he meets one of the sentries, who is a young man of 19. And the Muhammad says, 19, nice age. An age when you think you can clasp the whole world in your palm, like a rare diamond. I was 21 when I came to, the, came to Dalatabad first and built this fort. I supervised the placing of every brick in it and I said to myself, one day I shall build my own history like this, brick by brick. One night I was standing on the ramparts of the old fort here. There was a torch near me flapping its wild wings and scattering golden feathers on everything in sight. There was a half-built gate nearby trying to contain the sky within its cleft. Suddenly something happened, as though someone had cast a spell. The torch, the gate, the fort and the sky all melted and merged and flowed in my bloodstream with the darkness of the night. The moment shed its symbols, its questions and answers, and stood naked and calm where the stars throbbed in my veins. I was the earth, was the grass, was the smoke, was the sky. Suddenly a sentry called from far, attention, attention, and to that challenge the half-burnt torch and the half-built gate fell, to, fell apart. No, young man, I don't envy you your, your youth, your youth. All that you have to face and suffer is still ahead of you. Look at me. You have searched for that moment since then, and here I am still searching for it. But in the last four years, I have seen only the woods hanging to the, clinging to the earth, heard only the howl of wild wolves and the answering bay of street dogs. Another 20 years and you'll be as old as me. I, may be li I might be lying under those woods there by then. Do you think you'll remember me then? So he's obviously identifying partly with the, the youth of the century, and he remembers his own youth when he felt that the entire world belonged to him. But then he also then looks back uh, in irony and looks at how his present life is couldn't be more different from his youth, when now he has become uh, completely isolated by uh, all those whom he thought he could trust, who have now betrayed him, who have now tried to kill him. And so now he feels extremely lonely and isolated right, as someone who cannot keep the kingdom together. 
who uh, believes that he is above all the laws of justice that he for formulates, and yes, and yet is unable to actually um, uh, enact an actual uh, realizable concrete program of justice, which is constituted only by the people and their interests. He also realizes that uh, the uh, Hindu homes, every Hindu home has become a domestic mint. He looks at how traders are just waiting for me to close my eyes and in my whole kingdom there are only two people I can trust, En Ul Mulk and Shehabuddin's father. What should I do, Barani? What would you prescribe for this honeycomb of disease? So he's not able to trust anyone. Even the people, even his plan to actually produce uh, copper, copper currency has been subverted by the production of counterfeit copper coins and mass corruption. And uh, his historian, Barani, who's only a historian, says that uh, when he asks, when he asks Barani what to do, Barani says, I cannot prescribe, I, can, I cannot prescribe. It's not my, my place to prescribe what the king or what the sultan should do. And he says that maybe perhaps he should just join the ranks of learned men since he's learned, learned himself and abandon the kingdom. But Tughlaq is unable to abandon, unwilling and unable to abandon the kingdom, right? He is, uh, on one hand, he would wish to sit by the Kaaba in Mecca and search for peace, which Dalat Abad hasn't given me, which hasn't given him. But at the same time, he realizes that there is, that he is consumed and possessed by this disease for power, for authority, which he just cannot seem to be able to shake off and let go. Right? So he, he says that, don't you see uh, this patient, referring to himself, racked by fear and crazed by the fear of the, of the enveloping vultures, can't be separated from me? Don't you see that the only way I can abdicate the throne is by killing myself? I could have done something if the vultures weren't so close. I could have crawled forward my knees and elbows. But what can you do when every moment you expect a beak to dig into you and tear a muscle out? What can you do? Right? So he is, he is uh, on the one hand, he is willing to let go of everything and he wishes that he could let go of everything and, and search for peace uh, in, 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 in Mecca. But on the other hand, he also feels that he cannot let go of his kingdom precisely at this very insecure moment where everyone is trying to uh, topple uh, and overturn his, his, his power and authority. Barani says that, Your Majesty, there was a time when you believed in ideal, in love, in peace, in God. What has happened to those ideals? You won't let your subjects pray. You torture them for the smallest offense. Hang them on suspicion. Why this bloodshed? Please stop it, and I promise your majesty something better will emerge out of it. And Muhammad bin Tughlaq says, but for that I'll have to admit I've been wrong all along. So he's not willing to admit that he was wrong in the first place by carrying out all these preemptive uh, measures to quash any rebellion by killing people at the slightest suspicion. And I know I haven't. I have something to give, something to teach, which may open the eyes of history, but I have to do it within this life. I've got to make them listen to me before I lose even that. Right? So he's determined to not let go of his ideals, that he will commit any amount of violence and bloodshed in the name of his own ideals. The fact that he is striving very hard, uh, he's desperate to actually present himself as uh, an ideal ruler. So he's, is, and which is why, in fact, the uh, play is really about the writing of history itself, about what it means to write uh, history. What does it mean to write an official history? And in what ways can we actually question official history for its prejudices, for its loopholes? And uh, it is also in some sense popularizes the uh, image, the impression of Muhammad as mad, as a madman, as a madman who is driven by his own uh, passion, his own, his own desire for power. The ghosts of which are, are, uh, are uh, refused to leave him in peace. Right, so, so even though he seems to apparently desire peace and, and equality and calm and harmony, he's unable to actually let go of his own, uh, his own uh, greed and greed for power, absolute power. In uh, scene 9, Azam and Aziz uh, accidentally chance upon Qiyasuddin, who is on his way to meet the um, uh, Sultan uh, because he's been invited to actually purify and bless the new capital of Dalatabad. Aziz and Azam uh, capture uh, Ghiyasuddin and uh, they end up murdering him and Aziz impersonates Ghiyasuddin uh, in order to gain access to uh, the Sultan and his court. 
Ghiasuddin himself is, uh, even though he's been invited as a uh, as uh, as an Abbasid uh, who, a sheikh who can bless, who has the power to bless and purify the, the capital, he's himself uh, someone who comes from a very humble and modest background. He says he grew up in filth and he lived in filth, and then a letter from nowhere. Right, so he believes that this letter, this invitation from the Sultan, will give him the prestige and the power that he, that he never had back in back at home. In scene 10, uh, Tughlaq discovers from his stepmother that she killed, uh, she poisoned uh, Najib to death, his prime minister. And so she also orders uh, his stepmother to be poisoned to death. Right? He is upset that his stepmother is also, has also betrayed him. So he believes that Najib has been killed for no reason, while uh, in response to his stepmother's accusations, he says that he killed his father and his brother for an ideal. In scene 11, when Aziz makes his appearance as uh, Ghiasuddin, there are many people, uh, many, of them, many of whom are Hindus in the audience, who uh, recognize him as the wayside robber who uh, killed his children, their children, and forbid them from, uh, from, from escaping. Right? So they all accuse him of having captured them, tortured them, killed their children uh, for having robbed them of their wealth. And this is when uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq also discovers the, the real person who's behind the disguise. And in scene 13, we see that, that Muhammad finally finds his, his most loyal companion in Aziz, who is the real double. He finds his match in Aziz, who has managed to subvert all his plans, uh, all his strategies, to uh, consolidate his power and authority. So the only one who actually benefits from all the political contradictions of the Sultan and the loopholes in his plan is Aziz. And even though the historian Barani uh, warns Tughlaq from giving, from granting or offering um, Aziz a position in his court, Muhammad believes that he can finally only recognize himself in Aziz, right, as a man who wanted more than he could have, right. So he, he identifies and admires Aziz, Aziz's ambition, right, his, uh, his ambition, his desire to move above his own low station. And in the last conversation between Aziz and uh, the Sultan, Aziz uh, reveals his uh, past conspiracies to the, uh, his, um, his plots, his plans to the Sultan. And Tughlaq is completely impressed by Aziz's uh, courage. So even uh, just as he's trying to, he's about on the verge of uh, killing uh, Aziz, Aziz says that, come on sir, let's be sensible. You know his majesty will never do that to me, as in will never imprison me or kill me. He says, ever since your majesty came to the throne, I have been your most devout servant. I have studied every order followed every instruction, considered every measure of your majesty's with the greatest attention. I insist I am your majesty's true disciple. Then later on Aziz says, your majesty has publicly welcomed me as a saint, started the pub public prayers after a lapse of five years in my honor, called me a savior. Your majesty has even, forgive me for pointing it out, I wasn't responsible for it, fallen at my feet publicly. Then Aziz says, I am not a common blackmailer, your majesty. I stand here on the strength of my convictions and my loyalty to you. Aziz says, I was a poor starving dhobi when your majesty came to the throne and declared the brotherhood of all religions. Does the sultan remember the brahmin who brought the case against him and won? I was that brahmin. Was that disguise necessary? Aziz says, I believe so. Since soon after your majesty introduced the new copper currency, I succumbed to its temptation. Then. There was enough money in that business, but too much competition. Soon it became unprofitable. So we took the silver dinars and went to Doab and bought some land there for farming. And Mohammed realizes that he has bought the land dirt cheap and collected also the state subsidy for the farmers. And when they discovered, they escaped to the hills and became wayside robbers. Aziz says, your majesty missed out an important stage in my life. Your officers tracked down criminals with the zest of a tribe of hunters 
and there's only one way to escape them. We join them. We had to shift the corpses of all the rebels executed by the state and hang them up for exhibition. Such famous kings, warriors and leaders of men passed through our hands then. Beautiful strong bodies and bodies eaten up by corruption. All, all were stuffed with rod with straw and went up to the top of the poles. One day suddenly I had a revelation. This was all human life was worth, I said. This was the real meaning of the mystery of death, straw and skin. With that enlightenment, I found peace. We left the camp and head, headed for the hills. So he found peace in the fact that this was all that human life was worth. And he discovered that all the, the princes and kings and chieftains that he had killed, all the warriors he had killed, were only, was, was only skin and bones. And they could easily be stuffed with straw and uh, exhibited as uh, trophies of the Sultan's power. Then Aziz says, one day I heard about a beggar who claimed to be Gyasuddin Abbasid and was on his way to the capital. I couldn't resist the temptation of seeing my master in person. I admit I killed Gyasuddin and cheated you. Yet I am your majesty's true disciple. I ask you, your majesty, which other man in India has spent five years of his life fitting every act, deed and thought to his majesty's words? The, the Sultan is, is enraged by Aziz's treachery, but he can't help being impressed by the man's cunning cleverness and courage. So he, Aziz says that, what if, I'm a, what if I'm a dhobi? I may be masquerading as a saint, but I'm still, a saint is no match for a dhobi whose job is to wash away filth, right? So my job is to wash away filth and no saint can match me. So Muhammad is upset, but also very impressed by the uh, Aziz's insolence. And when he asks him on how he should punish him, Aziz says, make me an officer of your state. And he says that if he were made an officer in the state, he would do anything for him. He would show him his loyalty and he was ready to die for the Sultan. And so he finally does grant uh, Aziz with uh, a state office, much against the remonstrations of Barani, who thinks that he's making the worst mistake by appointing someone who is definitely going to betray him uh, and kill him. And then he says, all your life, Muhammad finds, realizes that he has finally met his mirror image, his companion in uh, Aziz. All your life you wait for someone who understands you and then you meet him, punishment for wanting too much. As he said, one day suddenly I had a revelation. And he also realizes that Ain un Mulk, by killing Sheikh Imamuddin, has also lost the support of the Maulvis and the people. So he needs uh, Tughlaq, uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq's support. And so ultimately, even though when Barani also uses an excuse to uh, leave the service of the Sultan under the pretext of meeting, of going, and going to see his dying mother, he realizes that he can no longer work for the Sultan because the Sultan is completely crazed and driven by politics. And there's no space left for peace, for transparency, for innocence. Right? I mean, everything is corrupt. Everything has been corrupted by the Sultan, the, 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 the Tughlaq's own plan for uh, to seize absolute power and justice. So, which is why he is uh, he ends up appointing Aziz as his uh, state officer. Right? So, let's actually end with that, uh, which is our discussion of Girish Karnad's Tuklak. We will uh, continue our discussion of Girish Karnad with his play on uh, the dream of Tipu Sultan next. Thank you. Mm -hmm.